Praise the Lord. Lodi Christian Life. How are we doing this week? I'm so excited to be here this morning. Yesterday, uh, my wife and I were driving and we were listening to something we haven't listened to since we were kids. We were listening to Kids and Company. And on it, they had Brother Bob and Brother Larry and they began to sing a song. And in that song, Pastor Larry poses a question that many of us will be asking when we get out of this. Where is my hairbrush? And as I'm listening to it, I'm wondering if there's some of us this morning, as we go and wash up and get ready for our day on the couch, if we would look in the mirror and ask, where is my faith? Where is my faith? Where is my hope? During the song, Reverend Bob comes up and exclaims that he gave that hairbrush to somebody else. And in my mind, I'm thinking, who can I give my hairbrush to? Who can I give my hope to? Who can I give my faith to? Because on this Sunday morning, I'm not cowering on the couch in fear, wondering how or if we're going to get out of this wondering what's going to happen, but I have faith in knowing where my hope comes from, where my faith comes from. I'm excited this morning. Let's, let's go ahead and, and this atmosphere in your couch, raise your hand, raise your voice, and let's begin to pray. We've got some needs. Let's pray for those that have been affected by COVID-19. Brother and sister, brother Eli Hernandez, let's keep him in prayer. Brother and sister Kevin Howard and the family. Brother Andreas Manera, let's keep him in prayer. Brother David Doyle, brother Schaefer and family. Brother Abbott and Gro brother Grogan's family, let's keep that family in prayer. Arlie Brian, Brian Fox's aunt, sister Arlie, let's keep them in prayer. There are other needs that are not connected to the coronavirus. Uh, Linda Boyd needs prayer. Alyssa Connor needs prayer. Karen Stevens needs prayer. Let's right where you're at, right where you stand or sit, let's just lift our hands and bring these needs before the Lord. Jesus, I come before you today knowing your prayer answering God. I have faith and hope uh, and I pray for every need that we have today. Everybody that's been affected by this virus, we pray, Lord, that you put your hand on this country, put your hand on this world, that you would raise our, these families up from, from their beds, Lord, that you would bring peace and comfort and, and hope to them in this time we pray lord for protection on our church family we pray for sister linda boyd and Alyssa connor and karen stevens we pray you would meet their needs in the name of jesus in the name of jesus in the name of jesus thank you lord amen just one announcement today let's remember that this week is our week for prayer and fasting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, let's take some time out and let's spend it in prayer and fasting and giving up something for, for the Lord in this time. Amen. Praise the Lord, Lord, I Christian life family. Amen. I always like to say it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Today, I cannot do that, uh, only with the exception of maybe about eight of us, and it always is good to see them here, obviously. Um, but I'll be glad when we're able to say that again. Um, I was thinking today, it is about eight weeks. For some, they passed the eight-week mark a few days ago. For some of us, it'll be eight weeks tomorrow, and um, that we have been quarantined in our homes. It has been difficult for us, very difficult for us, and I understand. And with Brother Gomez saying what he said concerning um, God and 
Where is God? Basically, that's what I'm going to speak about this morning. I'm going to speak about where is God? Where is God? We thought, some thought, well, maybe a couple weeks and this will all be over. And there are some of you that you have been in your homes since the very beginning of this. And it's almost like you're a prisoner in your home. And now some of what the reality is setting in of what this is all about. We've heard that there's going to be a glimmer of hope, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, things of that nature. And if there is, that is fine. With me, it's a little bit different. I still go to my office. I still uh, have Zoom meetings. I still have classes with my students, uh, though the platform is a little bit different now. And um, it's a Zoom meeting versus a classroom um, setting, but I still talk to them and still deal with them. But it's just a little bit different scenario because you look out and you're not able to go and be and do what you want to do. And if we're not careful, we say, where is God in all of this? And I want to draw your attention to the book of Job, chapter 23. Job, chapter 23. Job answers, and the word of God says, Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered for ever from my judge? Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. Even when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. This morning for a little while, I want to speak on where is God? Where is God? And that may be what a lot of people may be thinking today. Where's God in all of this? When I was a child, I um, did not grow up in the city. I didn't grow up hearing the horn, horns honking and traffic lights and all that kind of stuff. I didn't grow up listening to any of that. I didn't know what a drive-by shooting was until I came to California. I grew up in the cornfields, southern Illinois is where I grew up. And one of the great things that we did when, we was a, when I was a child is we played a very childish game that our children still play to this very day. It's called hide-and-seek. Some would hide in the barn. And some would hide in the wagon, and some would hide, you know, in, in the hay bales. And when we did it at night, it was even more fun because nobody could find anybody. And when you stop and think of what Job is saying, it kind of reminds me of that old childhood game. It's as if God is hiding from Job. He said, I traveled east looking for him. I find no one, then west, but not a trace. I go north, and he has hidden his tracks, then south, not even a glimpse. It's as if God and Job are playing hide and seek, but in reality, what God is really wanting to do and desires to do is that he wants to know him. He wants to know him. It is his desire that we rely on and experience his love and his compassion, his strength. So he says to all who are willing, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Unlike us, God knows what will happen tomorrow, next week, next year, next decade. He says, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. The psalmist David wrote this in Psalms 46 and 1. God is my refuge and strength, a very present help. In trouble. But if we want to find God, we must make the sincere effort to go after him. If we want to find God, we have to make the sincere effort to say, okay, God, I'm not going to play hide and seek. I'm going to go after you. 
maybe during this time, God is looking at us and saying, I have, he's saying, I pursued you and pursued you and pursued you. Now it's time for you to pursue me. Now it's time for you to pursue me. Let me tell you some of the things that I have done under quarantine. Get ready, Lodi Christian Life. I have finished the manual for small groups. 47 pages worth. I have finished the manual for New Believers membership class. I have finished the fill in the blank for New Believers membership class. I'm not waiting for us just to open the doors. And I'll be glad when we do. But I'm going after so that when we do open the doors, we are ready to go into the highways and byways and compel them to come. I'm going to keep my hands busy doing something for God because I know this shall come to pass. Do you still have as much faith, Brother Bishop, as you had before? I have more faith right now than I've ever had in my entire life. I have great peace that God is taking care of this right now. God sets up kings, the Bible says, and he brings them down. This did not take God by surprise. You can not watch the news or pick up the newspaper without hearing about how bad it is and things will never return to normal, whatever normal may be. In the midst of all of this, these situations, sometimes we ask, where is God in all this mess? God's not sitting up in heaven wringing his hand saying, what are, what's going to happen? God knew it was coming. God knew what was going on. He allowed what was going on maybe just for us to pursue him. Maybe for us just to, instead of God coming after us all the time. In the, in the book of Genesis, Genesis we read of, of one by the name of Adam. And every evening, the Lord would come out and he would commune with Adam. And he came out as he did on other times. And he says, Adam, Adam, where art thou? And sometimes if we're not careful, we get so busy in working for God that we stop living for God. Sometimes it's not about how much work we do for God. What God is wanting is the relationship with him. He's wanting that communion with him. Not just 30 minutes or an hour worth of prayer, but really just walking with God. Walking with God. Talking with God. Just like you would your spouse sitting at the coffee table every morning with a cup of coffee. Just like you would your, your, your children or whatever, a friend or whatever the situation may be. Talking and just Communing with God in a way that it's not awkward. He communed with Adam every day at the cool of the day, but on this day, Adam didn't show up. And God's looking for him and saying, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Maybe God is looking at us today and saying, Lodi Christian life, where are you? Where are you? Hello? Hello? We have experienced some of the most incredible blessings over the last two years. Phenomenal blessings. And we didn't ask for any of it. God just poured it out and poured it out and poured it out. And I thank God for that. But now we've had our backs pushed against the wall. And the same God that was giving us all the blessings that he gave us starting two years ago is the same God that is right there. He's with you in the good times. He's with you in the bad times. It doesn't make any difference. God is still there. Where is God? God is right where you're at today. That's where God's at. And Adam finally says, I'm over here, Lord. He says, why are you hiding, Adam? Days gone by, you never hid. Maybe days gone by, we just took for granted all the blessings that the Lord has given to us. And now we're not having those blessings. Blessings by being able to come together as a family of God at Lodi Christian Life and shaking hands and hugging necks and seeing children who are cooped up in their houses saying, Mama, I want to go to Sunday school. Young people saying, I want to get out and go and get involved with young people. Hyping saying, I, I, we need to gather together and have a good time. 
Maybe God has put the entire brakes on everything so that we would pursue God in a way that when we come back as a family of God, it's never the same. That we don't take the things of God for granted. We don't take the spirit of God for granted. We don't take the people of God for granted. Where is God? Tomorrow will be a difficult day for me personally. Tomorrow will be a day that I will most likely just be by myself. Because tomorrow is the anniversary of the passing of one of the greatest men in my life that ever came into my life. And that individual is my father. My father passed away two years ago tomorrow. My father was 92 years old. My father was a wise man. He was my pastor. Um, but he was a wise man. And one day he looked at me and he said, son, I'm going to tell you something. He said, one day you're going to pastor Lodi Christian Life. And for you, those of you who are listening, Lodi Christian Life, you knew my father. You knew I, my relationship with my dad. My dad adopted me when I was 12 years old. I was not born into his home. But I received the Holy Ghost in my father's arms. And in a tank similar to that right there, he held me and baptized me. And I looked at my dad and I said, oh, dad, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. He said, son, I won't be here to see it. But it's going to happen. And true to his word, he was not here to see it. And it has happened. There have been many times I wish that my father was here because I could talk to him. Bounce some things off to, on him at times. And as they say, you never miss the water till the well runs dry. And that is so true. But when my, my dad passed away, I had things that I had to do. And I was not able to grieve until several weeks later. And I remember going out to the cemetery where my father is buried. I took a lawn chair with me. And I sat that lawn chair on his grave. And I sat there for hours, literally hours. I was in a suit. I'd gone to the office for a little while, then went and got that lawn chair. I put that lawn chair out on his grave, and I sat there, and I was quiet for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, tears out of nowhere started running down my face. And I started talking to God, and I said, God, I hurt so bad. And the only thing God said was, I am. I said, God, my heart is so heavy. And God said, I am. I said, God, he was the one sure thing I've always had in my life. And God said, I am. I said, God, how do I move past this? And in frustration, I kicked that chair across two grave plots. And I literally got down on the grave of my father. And I said, God, I don't understand. You am what? It doesn't make sense, God. You am what? And God just whispered my name. And he said, Richard, I am whatever you need me to be. Job concludes his talking to God, and he says, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Maybe right now God is trying you. Maybe right now God is putting you through the test, Lodi Christian life. 
a test you have never had to face before. And Job put it this way. He says, when I come through this test and I come through this difficulty, I will come forth shining like gold. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemies, the Bible says. For there's going to come a day that I'm not going to stay down in the pit. There's going to come a day I'm not going to stay down where I'm at right now, but I shall arise. There's going to come a day when the doors of the church are going to be open. You'll be able to go and do what you want to do. But right now, maybe God is saying, I just need your attention right now because of something that I want you to do when we get out of this quarantine. Don't look at it as your prison. Look at it as an opportunity of what God is wanting to do in your life. God's wanting to mold you. God's wanting to make you. God's wanting to do something. He's trying to take some things out of your life and put some things into your life. Here are the facts. There are wars, and there's rumors of wars. The economy is right. It's ruined. It's in the tank. The political world has Americans scared. It seems as if economies are collapsing around the globe. To some, they have proven that God does not exist in our country, our schools, and our churches. They're saying America needs God more than ever before. And he's nowhere to be found. Where is God when you need him? I am not an English teacher, though I have taught that. I'm not a grammarian. But let me explain some things about the English language. A verb expresses action, occurrence, or existence. A noun names persons, places, things, and ideas. An adjective modifies a noun or pronoun. A verb modifies verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. A pronoun takes the place of a noun in a sentence. A preposition is a function word that always has an object which is usually a noun or pronoun. A conjunction functions as a connector, and an interjection is an exclamation which may be followed by an exclamation point or by a comma. You're saying, what does that have to do with where is God? Is this a Sunday morning English lesson? No, just hang on, Lodi Christian Life. The part of speech that helps us to understand where something or someone is and where it's located is called a prepositional phrase. Like the songbook is on the pulpit. The stool is under the piano. The pen is in my pocket. When we ask the question, where is God, I think prepositions can help us. Where is God? Here's where God is. God is in trouble. Now, if I stop right there, some of you are going to say, what do you mean God is in trouble? God's never in trouble. My point exactly. God is not depleted of his resources. God is in your trouble. That's where God's at right now. God is right where you're at. He is right in the midst of your difficulty. He's right in the midst of your problem. He's right in the midst of you not knowing what to do or where to turn or where to go. God is right there. God is in your trouble this morning. God is not in trouble as you think. He's in the midst of your troubles. All of a sudden, we start reading the Word of God, and we get back into the Word of God. Put the newspaper down. Shut the radio off. Turn on worship music. Get in the Bible and see what's going on in your world. You start reading the Word of God, and you start reading about a man by the name of Joshua. And Joshua starts looking at this city called Jericho. What am I going to do with this? The walls are high. The walls are thick. And history tells us that three chariots could race on the top of the walls of Jericho and never touch each other. It was that thick. And the Lord looks at them and says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to walk around the walls. Now, to a lot of us, that's like, what do you mean walk around the walls? That's a weird kind of warfare. God's ways are higher than my ways. Sometimes I don't even understand them. But it's not about understanding them. It's walking in obedience because of them. 
God's not going to make sense sometimes. He's just going to look at us and he's going to say, I need you to walk this direction. This is all I'm going to say right now, but I need for you to trust me. And all of a sudden they started walking. One day, one time around the wall. Two days, another time around the wall. All the way down till you get to the seventh day. And on the seventh day they walked around it how many times? Seven. And on the seventh time the Lord said, now this is what I want you to do. I want you to blow the trumpet. Some of you need to stand up right where you're at right now because you're discouraged. Right where you're at right now because you're, 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 you're dealing with cabin fever, as it were. And you're saying, where's God in all this? What you need to do is stand up in your living room right now. Lift your hands to Jesus and say, God, I still believe in you. God, I still trust you. God, my faith is still in you today because I have no other individual to turn to. And all of a sudden, out of obedience to God, he said, on the seventh time, I want you to lift your voice. I want you to play the instruments. I want you to do everything you can do. And they started worshiping God. And all of a sudden, the rumble starts taking place within those walls. And the Bible says, then the walls came down flat. And they walked into their victorious. Why? Because God was with them right in the midst of their difficulty. God was with them right in the midst of their trouble. God was with them right in the midst of their turmoil. Where is God? God is with you. In your trouble, Paul and Silas, they were sitting in prison. Their backs were beaten. And the Bible says they didn't sit there and they didn't fold their arms sitting in the mully grubs. No, that's not what they did. The Bible says, and at midnight, they sang praises to the Lord. And at midnight, their worst time of, of, of their entire life, the darkest part of the night, at midnight, they sang praises to God. And all of a sudden, an earthquake takes place. And the shackles that held them fast to the wall and the shackles that held their feet fast to the floor were now unloosed and they're standing up. And the jailer was going to kill himself. And Paul said, you do yourself no harm. We're all here. We're all here. When I start looking about at that, it starts reminding me of the book of, of Daniel. When they took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and because they would not bow, the king says, you make that furnace seven times hotter. They make it seven times hotter. And they throw them in there. And here they are. They had them bound up with the king's ropes. And the king looks in and says, did we not put three in there? I said, yeah, we put three in there, king. He said, well, how come there's four of them in there and one looks like the son of God? Because God is with you in the midst of your difficulty. God is with you in the midst of your trouble. God is with you when everything else is turned against you. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But I'll be with you to the end of the world, the Bible says. Where is God? Job, you look forward and you look backward, but you didn't find God. You look to the left and you didn't find him. You look to the right, you didn't find him. You look north, you look south, you look east, you look west, you didn't find him. Instead of looking around to find God, Job, why don't you start looking up to see God? You can't look to the right, he's not there, it says. Can't look to the left, he's not there. I'm looking to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And I'm looking at Job saying, Job, you've been looking around is the problem. Start looking up. That's where you're going to find God. You're going to find God by looking up. You're going to find God by lifting your hands in worship and praise. You're going to find God by giving yourself at this time during this quarantine to God like you've never given yourself to God. God is where the lost and hurting are. God is where the battered and the bruised are. God is where the shackled and the imprisoned are. God is in the midst of your dilemma. Psalms 107 and 13 says, only you, talking about God, only you, God, give us victory. And only you, God, crush our enemies. There's an old song that says, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. He's my friend. You may be able to keep me out of the church, but you can't keep me away from God. You may be able to keep me from going a lot of different places, 
But when I can't go to him, he comes to me. All I have to do is I call Abba Father. I call Daddy. And Daddy pushes all of heaven aside and all of hell aside and says, Okay, Richard, what is it that you need today? That's the kind of God that I'm talking about. That's where God is. Romans 8 and 13 says this. So what shall we say about this? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for me, there doesn't make any difference who's against me at that point. If I don't please God, it doesn't make any difference who I please. I have to please God. I have to know that God is with me. Where is God's address? It's not at the end of your street. It's not 322 West Elm Street. It's not 300 Hillborn Street. God's address, I'm going to tell you where it's at. God's address is at the end of your rope. God's address is at the end of your rope. When you don't know what else to do, you tie a knot in the end of it and you just hang on saying, God is going to bring me out. God is going to be there with me. Where's God? Right where I'm at. God is not in trouble. God is in your trouble. Where else is God? God is in charge. Where is God? God's in charge. God's in charge of everything. If there's anything our bishop has always said here at Lodi Christian Life is that none of this took God by surprise. God is in charge. You're saying, but pastor, you don't understand. I'm trying to make my mortgage. God is in charge, homeowner. You're saying, pastor, you don't understand. I've got a car payment to, to, to make. Automobile owner, God's in charge. You're saying, I got rent to make. God's in charge. I got families with COVID-19. God's the healer. I'm running here and there, and I'm, I'm frightful. God's our peace. He's our shalom. He's our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our, our provider. In the midst of all of this, God is still in control. Nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing takes God by storm. He holds the world in the palm of his hand, and he makes the world move at his very voice. We don't do that as human beings. I don't care what they say in Washington. I don't care what they say at the White House. I'm here to tell you right now, God has the final word because God is in charge. When God says it's over, then it's over. But until it's over and God says it's over, I'm going to keep on walking my hand in the master's hand because God is in control. Moses had nothing figured out in the wilderness. All he knew was that God said, I need you to take these people out of Egypt. He wasn't trained for that. He knew the niceties of Egypt. He was trained in the household of Pharaoh. He didn't know hardly anything about sheep herding, plus Egyptians hated sheep herders. And God looks at Moses and says, okay, now you're going to be a shepherd. And you're going to lead all these people out of Egypt. And he looks and says, God, I don't know how to do this. And God says, all I want you to do is listen. All I want you to do is start walking. I want you to start obeying. And God gets them to the Red Sea. He didn't know how to divide the Red Sea, but God did. He didn't know how to make bitter water sweet, but God did. He didn't know how to feed two million people, but God did. He didn't know how to keep them from grumbling and complaining. But God did. Why? Because God is in charge. Any time we are in over our head or down on our luck, just remember, Lord, I Christian life, God is in charge. God is in control. When doctors fear because of what they have just said to you with a devastating blow, and it gives you a hopeless feeling because the... Maybe the, the news from the doctor is not good. Understand, fear is not of God. Faith is of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a, 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 a spirit of love and a power and a sound mind, the Bible says. God was in charge when he dealt with a woman with an issue of blood. According to the law, she was ceremonially unclean. 
Nobody could touch her according to the law of Moses. Nobody could touch her except the one who was in control, except the one who was in charge, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so she pushes through the crowd here and there. She was determined. No matter what happened, she was going to get her touch. You might be sitting on your couch this morning, and you might be listening to this preacher preach this morning, and you're saying, why does he get so excited? Why is he so passionate about it? Because I know what Jesus has done in my life. I know what he has done in my life many years ago. Where is God? God was with this old boy when I was an alcoholic, and I haven't had a drink in over 30 years. That's the kind of God that I'm talking about. I'm dealing with individuals that I'm speaking to right now. God has delivered you from alcoholism. God's delivered you from drugs. God's delivered you from a lot of different addictions why because God is still in charge God is still in control of what's going on in your life that's the God that I serve finally she gets right to where Jesus is and maybe she had to stretch the furthest out there and finally she touches the hem of his garment the Bible says and all of a sudden she stops Jesus in his tracks like nobody else ever did And Jesus says, who's touching me? And all of a sudden, the disciples said, Lord, there's all kinds of people touching you. He said, no, you just don't get it. I felt virtue leave my body. I felt something leave me and went to somebody else. Who was it? So right in the midst of your quarantine, you can have the touch of God sitting on your couch. You can have the touch of God in your home like you have never had in your entire life. It all determines where you know that God is. If you're a child of God this morning, you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God is wherever you are, and God is still in charge of what's going on. When the layoff notice comes and includes your name, God is in charge. When tragedy strikes your home, as it has And we pray for those families. I'm thinking of my dear, dear friends, the Abbots, the Grogans, the Parkies. They lost their father, their husband, a grandfather. I'm thinking of other individuals who are still struggling with COVID-19. God is still in control. God is still in charge. I'm thinking of one of my own personal students, Brooklyn Grogan, today. I pray for her every day. Because she lost her grandfather. Brooklyn, today, if you're listening to this, God is still in control. God's still in charge. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows you're hurting right now. What about an individual by the name of Horatio Spafford? An individual who used to travel with one Dwight Moody. Many years ago, Dwight L. Moody was preaching in Britain. In the course of being over there, he writes Horatio Spafford and says, I want you to come to Britain. And so, Mr. Spafford being a man of means and wealth, an attorney in Chicago, left everything because of the fire that took place in Chicago, burned his businesses down, burned his resources down, his holdings down. He said, I have nothing else to live for. I might as well go. So he loads on a steamer and sends his wife and daughters on a steamer in front of him. And on the way, that steamer went down and he lost his wife and his children. And the only thing left was him and his son. And he got on the next steamer to head to Britain. And just as they got to the place where the last steamer went down, he went to the bow of that boat and he penned. One of the most beautiful hymns we still sing in the church today. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I ask us today, are we able to say that it is well with our soul today? Even though we are quarantined. Even though we are in the midst of what we are going through right now. Are we able to say it is well with my soul? Maybe you're listening this morning. Are you able to say, it is well with my soul? Maybe God's trying to get our attention. Maybe God's trying to get us off of everything else and say, I, know, I need you to get your focus back on me and let you know that it is well with my soul. 
The last is God is always on time. God is always on time. It doesn't make any difference what's going on in your life. God is always on time. God is in, in your trouble. God is in charge. And God is always on time. No one likes to wait. I don't like to wait. Sometimes Sister Bishop will look at me and she'll say, have patience. And I'll look back at her and say, I'm not a doctor. And uh, yet God is trying to teach us patience. Book of James tells us that very, very well. No one likes to wait. We wait in traffic. We wait in the carpool lane. We wait in holding patterns. We wait in the grocery store. We wait for the doctor. We wait for the spouse. We wait for the spouse. We wait for the spouse. We wait for retirement. We're waiting for this sermon to get over. We're waiting for Jesus to return. We wait, 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 it seems like, right? I have learned in life that just because God says wait does not mean he's saying no. What he's saying is he's simply saying just not right now. Just because you are delayed something does not mean that you're being denied. You need to understand that this morning, Lodi Christian Life. Just because you are being delayed something right now does not mean that God is denying you. Your blessing is building up even better as you wait. Look at your neighbor right now and say, increase. Waiting on God is the process of becoming what God wants you to be. What God does in us while we wait is just as important as what, he is, what we are willing to wait for. Waiting, biblical waiting, is not a passive waiting around for something to happen that will allow us to escape our troubles. In the process of waiting, there's some things that take place. Very quickly, I found that in waiting, you have to have faith. Brother Gomez talked about it this morning. He said you have to have faith. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 says this, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You have to have faith. And Paul went on to say this in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Not all things are good. This is not good. He said, but all things work together for the good that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. Everything is not always good. But God sometimes is doing his best to teach us something in the waiting period. Galatians 6 and 9 says this, let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessings if we don't give up. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for we will reap if we faint not, the Bible says. You're saying, Brother Bishop, I'm in this house and I've been here for the last four weeks. I understand that, beloved, and we may be there for another two weeks before we see anything starting to open up. But if that's what the case is, let's find out what God wants us to do in these next two weeks because God is still in control. Where is God? God's right there in your house right now. He's right there with you sitting on the living room couch or in that easy chair. Listen to your pastor right now. Waiting on the Lord requires trust. Waiting means that we give God the benefit of the doubt that he knows what he's doing, even though I don't. I may not understand it, but God's at work on my behalf. And waiting is God's way of seeing if we will trust him before we move forward. And the last thing that waiting does is waiting allows God to do his work. Waiting allows God to do his work. My faith and my trust is not what comes out of Washington, D.C. The Bible says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. Start quoting Psalms 121 and see if your faith doesn't start arising. See what God is able to do. God brought you this far. He's not going to leave you now. Where is God? God's right where you're at. Where is God? God's right in your dilemma. God's right in your praise. God's right in your adoration to him. God's right in your misunderstanding saying, God, I don't know where you're at. God understands all that. But God is still 
there. As a pastor, I want to speed up the growth process of a growing church and its ministries. Let's see it happen, God. Let's blow and go and just see it go, God. And I will tell you this right now. God's had to kind of pull me back and say, okay, not a problem. I'm glad you got all this passion, all this exuberance. But I need to talk to you about a few things. There's a lot of times I would go to my office. No one was there, and I would just sit there, and God just starts talking to your pastor at that point. I see much that we could do and should be doing. I see un. I see needs that are not being met. I see the hurts of people. I drive through neighborhoods in Lodi, and I'm bombarded at the thought of many people spending eternity without Jesus, and that bothers me. I've had a vision to reach my city, and I still have that vision to reach my city. I want it to be a reality, and I want it to happen now. And I question God, why not now, and why not bring it to pass now? And then God says, but my timing is best. I'm taking care of all of this. Before you see this. And he who is taking care of all of this. So that we can enjoy this right here. We've got to put our faith and our trust in. And know that God is still in our midst. And in control of everything that we do. In closing today. I ask this question. Is there a God? We know that that is a. A silly question. We know as Christians that there is a God. But maybe you're listening today and maybe you're not a Christian. And maybe you're just watching this preacher thinking this guy is passionate. He's ranting and raving about what God is able to do. I'm going to tell you why. Because God has healed my body. God has performed miracle after miracle after miracle in the, wife, in, in the life of my wife and also people that attend this church. God has delivered individuals in a way that most people would just be blown away at. Because it didn't take Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon and a drug rehab program and all that other kind of stuff. It took one trip down to this altar with people raising their hands. And just like that, God delivered them of their vices. So I ask you a question. If there is no God, who dressed the penguin in a tuxedo? If there is no God, who choreographed the waltz of the planets? If there is no God, who causes the body to heal? If there is no God, how did one rustic carpenter change the world? If there is no God, who crammed all that data into what we call DNA? If there is no God, why do we pray? If there is no God, who was Moses talking to at the burning bush? If it is, there is no God, who ignites the sun every morning? If there is no God, why is the Bible the all-time bestseller? If there is no God... How did the cross become the symbol of power? If there is no God, who sketches pictures in the sky? If there is no God, who sculpted the mountains with his very hand? If there is no God, who's answering your prayers right now? If there is no God, what's the point? Here's the point. The point is that there is a God, and he's got it all in the palm of his hand. Where is God? God is right where you're at. God is sitting on your couch beside you. God is driving down the street in your car with you. God is doing everything you are doing. God has never left you nor forsaken you. God is with you right now, Lord, I Christian life. And every individual that's listening under the sound of my voice, listen to this preacher when I tell you, God is with you right now in Jesus' name. Lift your hands wherever you're at and let's just call on the name of the Lord right now. Father, we love you. We magnify you. We glorify you, Lord, because we know, God, that you are with us. We know, God, you have never left us. We know, God, that even in our difficulty, our dilemma, Lord, and our, our lack of understanding, even sometimes lack of faith, God, you are still there with us. We love you for it. We bless you and we give you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, I love you, Lord. I praise you. I give you glory, God. Right now, God, reach into those living rooms, God, and touch the saints of Lodi Christian life. Reach down, God, as the tears may be falling down faces, God. Reach down, I pray, and do a work of healing in their life. Do a work of encouragement in their life. Be with them, God, I pray. Touch them by the power of the Holy Ghost. Maybe they're not members of, Christ of Lodi Christian life. Lord, 
I pray right now that you would reach down and you would do a work in their life. Fill them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Though there may be fear going on in their life. Though there may be doubt, God, and not understanding of what's happening in our world. God, reach down into that living room, I pray, and touch them. Let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, rest upon them, I pray. Touch them right now in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We give you glory and honor in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Praise God. Lord, I Christian life, just know this. God is still in control. God's got everything in the palm of his hand. Where is God? God is right where you are. He's never left you. He's not going to leave you. He's never forsaken you. He knows exactly where you're at. And we will get through this. Why? Because God is still on the throne. Amen. Amen. Just want to remind you that this week begins our three days of prayer and fasting. Um, if you can do one day or all three days, we would appreciate it very much. I said in a post out on Facebook, let's believe God for the miraculous. And I still believe that. Let's believe God for the miraculous. Whatever the situation may be. We've been praying for Brother Eli Hernandez. We've been praying for different ones. And some have come out of COVID-19. Brother Eli Hernandez is still in the hospital right now. And I'd like for us to take Brother Eli Hernandez, who has blessed Lodi Christian Life family so very much on many, many different occasions, to the Lord this week. And I'm, I'm praying, God, bring that man of God out by the end of next week, in Jesus' name, or even before. His oxygen level is down to 50%, and we thank the Lord for that. But it needs to come down more. Um, Maybe some of you have heard some other difficulties that he's going through right now. God is able to take care of that because he is a, he is a healer in Jesus' name. But remember, this Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is our time of quarterly prayer and fasting. Amen. We look forward to seeing you again and being with you again this coming Wednesday. God bless you. We love you very, very much in Jesus' name.